Humans have a wide range of skin colors. These skin colors are the product of the amount of a pigment called eumelanin that's produced by specialized skin cells that we have called melanocytes. Lots of eumelanin production would correspond to darker skin, and very little eumelanin production would correspond to lighter skin. Most of us also produce a certain amount of another pigment called pheomelanin. This is a yellowish, brownish, reddish pigment. So what then determines the amount of eumelanin that our skin produces? It has to be genetic. I mean, we know intuitively that it's genetic. So what then are the genes and the associated proteins that are responsible for eumelanin production? Well, let's take a look. Eumelanin is a molecule, and on a molecular level, it looks like this. It's actually a polymer. Poly means many, and mer means unit. If we look more closely, we can start to make out some of the repeating units. As you can see, there are two key subunits involved. One of them is called 5,6-dihydroxyindole, or DHI. The other is called 5,6-dihydroxyindole, 2-carboxylic acid, or DHICA. So where do those come from? Well, it all starts with an amino acid called tyrosine that our cells have in abundance. In fact, tyrosine is one of the key building blocks for proteins. Our cells can produce something like 100,000 different types of protein, and so this amino acid tyrosine is pretty important. All right, so we have tyrosine in abundance. When tyrosine comes into contact with an enzyme called tyrosinase in the presence of oxygen, it gets converted into a molecule called dopaquinone. If there are high levels of a molecule called cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or CAMP, the dopaquinone gets converted into a molecule called dopachrome. Dopachrome will naturally break down into 5,6-dihydroxyindole, or DHI. But if it comes into contact with an enzyme called dopachrome tautomerase, or DCT, it'll get converted into the molecule 5,6-dihydroxyindole 2-carboxylic acid, or DHICA. And DHI, along with DHICA, those combine to form that eumelanin polymer. So we have a few key players to consider here. There's the enzyme tyrosinase, the molecule CAMP, and the enzyme dopachrome tautomerase, or DCT. If the tyrosinase enzyme is inhibited, or if there was a mutation in the tyrosinase gene that changed the way that the resulting protein worked, well, that would be pretty catastrophic to the whole pigment-producing pathway. This can lead to a rare condition called albinism, where a person is unable to produce hair or skin pigmentation. Similarly, if the DCT protein was suppressed, or if there was a mutation in the DCT gene that changed the efficiency of the DCT protein, then that too would change the amount of eumelanin that could be produced. And in fact, there are even a couple of DCT gene mutations that have been linked to albinism. It just depends on the nature of the mutation and how much it impacts the corresponding protein. Next, when it comes to the molecule cyclic adenosine monophosphate, well, we know what the result is here. If the melanocyte has lots of CAMP, then eumelanin would be produced. And if the melanocyte doesn't have a lot of CAMP, then actually pheomelanin would be produced. All right, well, what controls CAMP production? Well, for that, let's take a short detour. All right, if you were to examine a melanocyte cell up close, and, and I mean really up close, like more than a million times magnification, you'd find that melanocytes have many copies of a specialized protein sticking out of their membrane. These are actually transmembrane proteins. The protein spans the membrane, with part of the protein sticking out on the inside of the cell and part of the protein sticking out on the outside of the cell. This protein is called the melanocortin-1 receptor, or MC1R. It's probably easiest to think of the MC1R protein kind of like a light switch. 
If it gets stimulated by molecules on the outside of the cell, it changes shape. That change in shape results in a signal within the cell that starts a series of biochemical reactions. These reactions lead to an increase in the production of cyclic AMP. An increase in cyclic AMP likely means that there will be an increase in eumelanin production, depending on what's going on with other genes like tyrosinase or DCT. Now, if there had been a mutation in the MC1R gene that changed the shape of the MC1R protein, then it could impact how easily or how difficult it was for the MC1R light switch to be flipped, and thus how much cyclic AMP is produced. In addition to all of this, there's another protein that's involved called the agouti signaling protein, or ACIP, that's produced and exported from cells. If ACIP binds to the MC1R protein, it can prevent the MC1R protein for signaling for cyclic AMP production. So we've introduced yet two more genes and their respective proteins into the story, MC1R and agouti, or ACIP. All right, let's get back on track. Let's recap. Eumelanin is the dark pigment that melanocyte cells in our skin can produce. We've looked at four enzymes that can impact its production. Tyrosinase interacts with tyrosine and changes it into a precursor of eumelanin. Dopachrome tautomerase, or DCT, helps to generate the molecule DHICA, which is also a precursor of eumelanin. The molecule CAMP is needed for this whole process, and CAMP can only be produced in abundance if the MC1R protein is functioning and if the agouti signaling protein doesn't stop it. So, eumelanin production depends on whether or not there is a fully functioning tyrosinase enzyme and a fully functioning DCT enzyme and a fully functioning MC1R protein and an agouti signaling protein that isn't effective enough to sabotage the entire system. Even if all of those conditions are met, there are still more proteins that can significantly impact the amount of eumelanin that can be produced. The eumelanin is produced in specialized organelles called melanosomes within melanocytes. The protein OCA2 is involved in transporting tyrosine into the melanosome. If the melanosome doesn't have tyrosine, then it can't very well build eumelanin. There are also key ion transporters, like the proteins SLC24A5 and SLC45A2 that help to regulate the concentration of various ions within the melanosome that are integral to the eumelanin production process. I know, this all seems really complicated, but that's because it's actually pretty complicated. Suffice it to say, there are many, many ways that this eumelanin production system can be ramped up or dialed down, or even shut down completely. Given the molecular biology of this system, it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise that humans come in a myriad of shades of skin color. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.